Previously in part 1, we took this project from 3D scanning to printing and a full smooth painted finish. The link to that video is in the description below. To create the dashboard, inspired by the image design, I opened the 3ds Max and began modeling both speedometer and RPM gauge from scratch. My goal wasn't to create an exact replica, but to capture the MG look and feel while adding bits of my own style to the final result. I focused on building all the visual elements directly in 3D, carefully shaping the layouts, needle, numbers, and all the details to match that premium, high performance vibe. Once the graphics were ready, I rendered them as a series of frames, each represent different value for speed and RPM. Those frames then imported into Simhub, where I used a bit of JavaScript to animate them based on live telemetry data from the game. This script quickly loops through all frames and forced Simhub to load them into memory, avoiding any stutter or delay during gameplay. It runs only once at the beginning, and once loading is done, it hands over control to live telemetry logic. Green light, green light okay. Car on the right. Car on the left. Clear on the left. For the animated background, I used the Blackmagic Fusion to design and animate the motion graphics. If you are more familiar with After Effects, you can achieve similar results. For the rest of the layout elements, like icons, labels, and textures, I used Photoshop. Once all the assets were ready, I imported everything into SimHub, where I connected them to real-time telemetry data from the game using JavaScript expressions. This allowed me to drive the entire interface with live game data. One of the main challenges I faced during this project was on the electronic side. I used 12V LED buttons for the physical build, but the Pro microcontroller I was using operates at 5 volt logic. That creates a voltage mismatch, and directly connecting the buttons will have damage the board. So I started with the dot matrix perf board for flexible components. As the brain of the project, I used an Arduino Pro Micro, which handled all the input processing. To safely manage 12 buttons and switches, I used one PC817 optocoupler per input and 1K resistor for each optocoupler on pin 1. Now, here is the tricky part. PC817 only works when there is a complete path from the positive to the negative side, in other words, when current flow through it. But in my setup, the button's LED can be switched on or off using a separate switch. So, if the LED is off, no current flow through the circuit, which also prevents the optocoupler from working. To make the wiring functional, I connected the ground from the source power directly to pin 2 of all optocouplers. Then, for each button, I only used one wire as the signal line, which carries the positive 12V. This wire comes directly from the button and is connected to pin 1 of its corresponding optocoupler. Now, I can't turn the LED on or off without affecting the signal going to the optocoupler because the positive line is always present and switch only casts ground connection to the LED. The internal LED inside the PC817 turns on, triggering the output side and signaling to Arduino Pro Micro that the button was pressed. For the wiring, I used something called matrix wiring which connects all buttons in grid of row and columns. One side of each button is connected to a row and the other side to a column. In my setup, the row wire goes to pin 4 and the column wire goes to pin 3. When a button is pressed, it connects row and columns together and that's how the Arduino knows which button was pressed. I also add a small 101 ceramic capacitor between pin 3 of each optocoupler and Arduino's ground, hoping it will help stabilize the signal but it wasn't very stable, so I later switched to a better solution, which I will explain later in the video.
using modern tools and some AI helps, I created a full custom sketch for the Pro Micro that works as both a joystick and a keyboard. This allows me to send regular game inputs as well as system level commands like muting Windows Audio directly with the decades button using media key functions. Since I use latching toggle switches in my project, similar to those found in real GT race cars, those switches stay physically in the on or off position. But in sim racing, that behavior can cause issues. So I set them up as momentary switches, sending a short signal only once when flipped on or off. One of the main issues I faced during this project was ghosting and flickering in the matrix. The wiring is very sensitive to voltage fluctuations, and even a small electric noise or unstable grounding can cause false signal or rapid flickering. To help identify the issues, I use a tool called DIView to monitor the button press history. In this example, I wasn't pressing any button at all, but the matrix was still randomly triggering input. The issues was caused by electrical noise coming from a low quality power adapter. That noise affects the ground line making the matrix behave unpredictably. Matrix circuits are very sensitive. Even slight voltage instability can cause ghosting or flickering, where the system thinks buttons are being pressed when they are not. I wasn't really satisfied with how this hand-wired PCB looked, so I decided to level up and make my first professional PCB. After a bit of research, I found that using a laser machine is one of the best ways to trace a circuit at home. So, I ordered one and jumped in Fusion 360 to start designing. I made a few changes to the original circuit, I removed the capacitors and then I added diodes on pin 3 with the strip side of the diode facing the PCH17, this new board will be double sided. In Lightburn, I import all the layers of the PCB design. This software let me control the laser's power, speed and frequency. Making a PCB with a laser isn't a simple task. Too much power can burn or damage the cooper. That's why it's important to test and fine-tune settings carefully. The process begins with the cooper board, clean it thoroughly using alcohol to remove dust, grease or oxidation. A clean surface is key for getting sharp, accurate laser traces with an engraving circuit. After laser engraving, it's important to clean the board through using alcohol and sprays with compressed air. Tiny copper particles can accidentally connect to circuit paths and cause shorts. You can also use multimeter to test all the traces before moving forward. Once everything is checked out, it's time to apply the solar mask to protect the copper. I usually apply it first, thin layer to fill the engraving lines. Cure it under UV light for about 5 minutes, then apply a second coat for better coverage and durability. To apply the solar mask properly, I use the fine nylon mesh like the kind used in screen printing. It helps spread solar mask evenly and push into the engraved lines without leaving too much on the surface. This gives a clean finish and a better protection for the cooper. After curing the solder mask, I put the board back onto the laser machine for one last pass. This step is important to retrace the cooper path on both sides and also to engrave the labels and text directly onto the board. This makes the PCB easier to understand and gives it a more professional look.
I mean several versions of this PCB before getting everything right. This one of the early ones, I used the green cooper and kept the same matte finish I like. Every version helped me improve the layout and details step by step. In the next video, we will test Bugbot Live in-game, exploring its functionality and take a close-up look at how it performed during actual racing stations. If you found this helpful or inspiring, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to support the channel. Thanks for watching.